Emotionally young, what does it mean to be emotionally young? I actually want to push a few buttons today because as a speaker and a consultant, I am asked to speak on generations in the workplace. I've been doing that now for over five years. I've been a professional speaker for 15 years. And typically what I talk about is the four generations in the workplace. When I came here today, I was going to talk about Zoomers who refuse to age. And you know you're a Zoomer when you are a baby boomer who says, I will not grow old. <laughs> Um, and actually what I'd like to challenge you in the room, if you are a boomer, you know who you are because you sit between the range of 46 and 64. Uh, you are a Gen X if you're in your 30s up until your mid-40s, and you are a Gen Y if you're in your 20s. Now, we can look at the generations and say, yes, we can segregate and look at the generations and say, well, you know, the ages separate us. But I actually don't believe any of that's true. And in fact, my approach around the Zoomer and the generational um, information that I present is really about you can be a Zoomer in a Gen Y body. You could be a Gen Y in a Zoomer body. Do any of you agree with that concept? Because to generalize and say that because we're from a certain generation, we're all the same is inaccurate. However, in my research, it has shown that there are certain values that are uh, attached to each of the generations. So you know you're a baby boomer when happy hour is a nap. <laughs> you know you're a baby boomer when getting lucky means finding your car in the parking lot. <laughs> You know you're a Zoomer when you look at remaining emotionally young. Now, emotionally young means you're not pushing back against the change that is upon us. Emotionally young means you're not resisting technology, you're not resisting young people's ideas, you're not resisting the inevitable change that we are faced with in our world today. Do me a favor with the people you're seated beside. Put your hands up palm to palm. Don't worry about germs. We'll get you some Purell later on. <laughs> and I would like uh, someone, anyone, to push. Go now. Ah. <laughs> Hands down. So a uh, room full of highly intelligent people. Typically what happens is everybody pushes. <laughs> you know, we're supposedly highly intelligent, but everybody pushes. Well, there's a reason for that because the primitive brain is wired for fight or flight. Anybody who's done psychology, uh, you know, you know, fight or flight. Uh, however, evolution is forcing us at this time to not respond in typical reactionary behavior. Because if we do, we are not remaining emotionally young. In fact, what we're doing is becoming rigid and fixed in our beliefs and our perceptions. What we want to do is be flexible. And we all push back because the primitive brain says, I must protect, I must hold true to my beliefs, I must remain autonomous to what I know to be true about myself. Try this again, hands up, palm to palm with the people you're seated with, please. And this time, without indicating who's going to do what, Someone push, someone give slightly. <laughs> Go now. <Yeah. laughs> Hands down. So typically, the second time around, three things happen. Number one, neither person did anything. <laughs> and typically, when that happens, you get people going, well, that's useless. If nobody's doing anything, how's anything ever going to get done? So regardless of generation, that might be a personality response you have. If you're a strong driver personality, you're highly aggressive, you need professional help, come and talk to me later. <laughs> um, but, but typically, if we, we have this belief that if we say or do nothing, then something must be wrong or we're not moving forward. But it's actually an emotionally young person who recognizes that sometimes saying or doing nothing is perfect appropriate. How many of you in this room have kids? Teenagers? Young adults? My daughter Courtney is 21. When she was 15, it was a rough year. <laughs> it was probably her roughest year. And she came home one night and she had made some poor choices. <laughs> <laughs> and my husband and I looked at her and said, Courtney, those are poor choices. And she looked at us and waited for the onslaught of how we, wrong she was, and we didn't raise her, but we didn't say or do anything. In fact, we just looked at her and said, those were poor choices, and we left the room. She follows us. What do you mean there were poor choices? So aren't you going to punish me? Like, what are you going to do now? We said or did nothing. The next morning, we wake up. She's in our room at 6 in the morning. Aren't you going to say or do something? What I did was wrong. I think you should ground me <laughs> for a year. My husband and I looked at her and said, that's great. Wow, self-punishment. Great example of saying or doing nothing and actually creating a choice or result from somebody's own decision. Second thing that happens in that interaction is the other person who might have pushed, if you were the person pushing, again, highly aggressive, you know what that means. Uh, but if the other person eased up on their pushing, you would have, or pardon me, was giving, you would have eased up on your pushing because for every action, there's an equal and opposite. Yeah. See, highly intelligent. <laughs> Emotionally young people recognize 
that in order to move forward in this environment, to evolve to where we're all going, we must be willing to give, to push when appropriate, to say or do nothing when it's appropriate. I have a question for you, and that is, how are we going, whoops, wrong button, that helps. Oh, that's still the wrong button. There we go. How will you live when you're 80? Because it's not the way anybody you know to be 80 is going to live today. Physically, they have invented nanobots, which how many of you remember, and this will really show your age, the movie Fantastic Voyage? Yeah. <laughs> and you swallowed, they went inside the human body and this, this uh, ship navigated the human body. They actually have nanotechnology that can do that. We're about five years away from that. And that technology is going to show disease markers in the body. So you'll be able to tell with swallowing this pill that's gonna navigate itself through your body, whether you're marked for cardiovascular disease or you're marked for diabetes or any of the illnesses. So physically young, how are we gonna look when we're 80? You know, all the presentations we've heard today about the environment and uh, the presentation about, you know, aliens and what, you know, are there aliens and what the planet looks like and get going from zero to one. Really the question needs to be, can this happen in our lifetime? And if we think in linear terms, which is we're gonna to live to 80, then we think it cannot happen. But Ray Kurzweil proposes that we'll live to a thousand with the technology that's available to us today. Now, I know that's a wild thought because you think to yourself, live to a thousand. But how would our lives look emotionally different if we lived a thousand years versus upwards to a hundred? What if time froze at all of us being 45 years of age? What would that kind of society or environment look like? Well, it's interesting to me because I think in today's environment, we are feeling like this most pretty much on a regular basis. In other words, change is coming at us. We're being pushed against with change. For the young people in the group, you're very adaptable to change because it's all you've known. I like to say Gen Ys were born and millennials were born with technology in their cribs. Today, when, when kids are born, they're in their crib, they do have actual computers. They're actual, you know, instead of a mobile that we had in my, my day where you looked at it and they played music, babies have computers that they literally can touch with their feet or hand and it interacts with them. The difference between adaptability, Gen Y is so adaptable. I often say that if you're not a progressive, emotionally young Zoomer, then you're what I call a bitter boomer. And if you're a woman who hates young women with confidence, then you're a bitchy, bo bitter boomer woman. <laughs> Uh, and really, <laughs> and the reason I, I say that is because if we're a boomer in this room and you're pushing against the Gen Y or Gen X mentality, you're probably experiencing high level of tension in the workplace. You're also probably experiencing lower levels of creativity. Interesting discussions this day with the other speakers, Kevin, uh, who you're going to hear, and I can't wait to hear his presentation, said, you know, he gets asked to mentor a lot of young people um, as an inspiring person and with lots to teach them. And he said, you know, boomers need to look at mentoring and teaching more of Gen X and Y. And for the Gen Xers in the room, you are absolutely depressed with the statistic that boomers will not be retiring at 65. It is a true statistic, actually, they're increasing retirement. You know that we've lifted it in British Columbia, that there is no mandatory retirement, nor is there any in Ontario. And a lot of American states are lifting it as well. And I actually predict with the health progress that we're making, retirement probably will become a non-issue, and it'll depend on wellness, how long you want to work. And if you love what you do, why wouldn't you keep working anyway, right? So with Gen Y, they're saying, I've got all this confidence. Now, boomers say things like, they push back and go, you know, they come, they show up and they're entitled, or they show up and they expect too much, or they want to get promoted too soon. And I turn it right back around on the boomer and I say, wait a second, whose kids are these people? Because guess who raised them? We did. Now, I stand before you as a 46-year-old. I consider myself a Gen X Zoomer cusper. <laughs> Hey, if Obama can call himself a Gen Xer at 48, I figure I've got some wiggle room there, right? And here's the deal. Gen Ys have never been told no or that they cannot. I'm generalizing Gen Ys, so don't get ticked at me here. Just bear me out, okay? So here's the deal with us boomers. We were raised to believe you worked hard and then you die. <laughs> Inspiring, isn't it? We work hard and then we die because our parents, the traditionalists said, get a job, stay there for life, retire, get RSPs, be frugal with your money and life will be good. Well, we, we boomers entered the workforce. Okay, I left home at 18. How many boomers in the room you left home at 18? We left home and in fact, our parents said to us, don't come back. And we didn't wanna go back. 
because we, it was not an environment that was conducive to us being in an autonomous environment. But our kids today, I have a statistic for you, you're going to hate me, I'm okay with it, here's the statistic. The average person is not leaving home today until the age of 35. No. That is the latest statistic. Until the age of 35. Now some of you in this room are in that range and you're going... Yeah, yeah. Okay. Why would they leave? Why would they leave? I'll tell you what we've done. Reg and I are Zoomers. We're moving out. <laughs> true story. We're moving out. And Courtney's like, I can't believe you're leaving me. And you know, the Canadian Canada here, we know that saying, stop feeding them cheese, right? But the truth is, with Gen Y, our daughter doesn't know anything but the innate confidence that she has. And there's many women in this room and, and young men who have the innate confidence because we raised you. Here's how I raised Courtney when she was a baby. Courtney, you can be and do anything and don't let anyone tell you otherwise. You can be as good as any boy out there. You can do whatever you want. Nothing can stop you. When you go to school and your teacher doesn't give you a, a report card or a grade that you're happy with, negotiate. <laughs> How many, uh, come on guys. So she goes to work, she gets her first job and she goes, I'm here. And the bitter boomer woman boss goes, who the hell do you think you are? Do you know how hard I've worked to get here? Right? Push back. Here's the deal. Generation Y are emotionally young innately because they have been raised to be permissive, they've been permissive or been allowed to be creative. With us boomers, and, and I'm just trying to give the Gen Xers and Ys some context here on how you can better deal with the boomers that are resisting perhaps your ideas or your ambitions. Because I'll tell you where the boomers are coming from. They're coming from a limited perspective of what they've known to be true for, up until now for them. And it scares the heck out of them to think that it could be easier and less work than what they've believed had to be true for them. That's the reality. So when your youth shows up and your creativity and your technological answers are available, it is incredibly fearful for them. They fear losing their job. They fear being redundant. They fear lack of relevance. What does that mean for you as a Gen X or a Y? You have to befriend them. You have to move with them. And the, and the resistance goes both ways. We are in a time where we don't know what the rules are, but I'll tell you something, regardless of what happens with technology, the number one thing that will remain constant is that we are all human beings. And that the success of our future is how we connect with each other, how we can relate to each other, how we can move forward with each other's ideas and not limit them based on generation or gender or any other thing. There's an actual magazine called Zoomer Magazine. It was created by Moses Zamer. It's an excellent magazine. And it talks all about how the Zoomers are the ones who are progressively looking at remaining emotionally young. Um, I stand before you as a, an example of somebody who is 46 years old and doesn't want to age. I'm very vain. <laughs> I am vain. I don't want to look um, older as I, uh, as I get older. And so that is an example of a Zoomer. To what extent would I go to prevent that from happening? I don't know. But you know what? There are 70 million cosmetic procedures happening annually now. And uh, in 2000, I believe the number was 16 million. So what's interesting is there is more Gen Ys and Gen Xs using Botox than there are baby boomers. I want you to think about that. Because Gen Y and X goes, I ain't going to get the wrinkles in the first place. So they're being very preventative, which then, again, ticks off the bitter boomer woman, right? So it's sort of a pattern. So how will you live uh, when you're 80? Now, by the way, oh, the clock is working. Fantastic. Um, so the question was, how, how will you be living? And so let me talk a little bit more about remaining physically young. I talked about nanotechnology. How many of you have heard of robotic heart surgery? Uh, yes, and so the advances being made with r robotic heart surgery. When I was 20 years old, my father was 43, and he died of a massive heart attack. And uh, in fact, if he had had the medical intervention that's available today, his life, he would have lived. It would have, his life would have been extended. And um, I find it fascinating with robotic heart surgery that they no longer have to break open the chest and rip open the rib cage to go in and repair the heart. And that now it's actually directed by robotic surgery by voice activation and by almost like a game-like console 
in order to go in and do the surgery. Some people might be scared by that, but it's actually progressing and helping our longevity. Um, Ray Kurzweil also says that there's actually supplements right now. How many of you are familiar with the concept of caloric restriction for longevity? Okay, so minimizing the amount of food you eat in order to extend the lifespan of the body. Well, doesn't that tie into environment and everything else we're talking about and how we consume food for longevity? So there's physical longevity, but really in the 18 minutes I had with you, is I wanted to talk about emotional young for those of us that are in the boomer category, but for all of us in any age range, beware of what you're pushing up against because we have biases that we not even, may not even be aware are running us or help or how, causing us to interact with people in a way that's not fully open and connected. And so I'd like to leave you with a final story. Typically as human beings, we always hope the other person that we're dealing with will change, right? And, and some of us will spend lifetimes trying to change people in our lives, our partners or our kids or our parents. And really when it comes down to it, remaining emotionally young is the individual, regardless of your age, who looks at change as a self-responsibility. They look at, I'm the one who has to change. I'm the one who has to give and take. Put your hands up again, palm to palm, if you could, please. This time, just move it back and forth, back and forth. Kumbaya, my lord. No, just hands down. It is Vancouver, after all, yeah. yeah. The point is, that's really what we want to create. And so just before I leave you, I want you to think of one more thing. Be careful of who you're asking to do the changing, because as I said, oftentimes we're hoping the other person will change or the other perspective will change. But if we're not taking responsibility, we may not get the results we're looking for. So I leave you with this final story where an atheist is walking through the woods. And by the way, even though I use the word God and atheist, this is not a religious story, the moral simply is, who are you asking to do the changing? Be careful who you're asking to do the changing. So this atheist is walking through the woods. It's a gorgeous day, blue sky, green trees, and she's walking along. And all of a sudden, without any warning, this huge bear jumps out of the woods, ready to pounce on the atheist. And the atheist screams at the top of her lungs, oh my God. <laughs> and everything freezes, including the bear with his paws overhead. And this big booming vi voice comes out of the sky and says, you call on me now? And the atheist says, yes. And the big booming voice says, after all these years, are you finally willing to become a Christian? And the atheist says, no, but could you make the bear one? <laughs> and the voice says, thy will be done. And the bear who was frozen with his paws slowly brought them together, smiled, bared his teeth, looked at the atheist and said, Lord, please bless this food I'm about to eat. <laughs> be careful who you're asking to do the changing. Thanks so much. Enjoy the rest of the afternoon. Thank you.